about how originally you went to mainland Japan and met your lovely wife and then moved down to Okinawa. What yeah. was the culture shock or what was the transition like between mainland Japan and then coming down to Okinawa, if indeed there was one? Well, yeah. Um... So Okinawan culture is not the same as Japanese culture, but it is similar in many, many ways, of course. You know, Okinawa being part of Japan since, whew, you know, the, 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 the Meiji Revolution. Um, so I was in Japan for about, uh, I came to Japan in, in, the, in the mid 90s and I got to Okinawa around 2000. So I had probably two or three years in mainland Japan before I came down to Okinawa. Um, of course, going to Japan for the first time was a major culture shock, as it is for, you know, all kind of Westerners. Um, because I was studying uh, Japanese at university, we'd been given sort of, you know, the, the briefing, we'd been given some introduction to how it was going to be and what we were going to learn. And of course, as studying Japanese, you're all, you're all kind of, you know, Japanophile, so you're looking forward to all of that stuff, right? Um, so mainland Japan was a huge adventure, and um, you know, I just really enjoyed it. I wasn't, I didn't get homesick. I didn't have any regrets or feel like I was missing anything at all. I just, I just loved my time there. I, I dived into it. I know we were studying. I'd gone there. I went to university to study Japanese as much in order to get to Japan to do karate and martial arts training as for you know the academic study so being there was a dream come true literally a dream come true for me i never when i was younger i never really thought that i would have the ability or capability to uh, go abroad and do something like that i mean i grew up in a in a you know kind of working class family in a small town and you know, we didn't do that kind of thing we didn't just go you know go off on adventures overseas but um I found my way to do that. And then, um, you know, Japan was a great adventure. Um, Japanese culture is in many ways quite reserved, especially up in Hokkaido where I was first. You know, it's cold and snowy up there and people tend to be kind of a little, a little more quiet and reserved. Um, and you have in Japanese culture this idea of uh, honne and tatemai. So, you know, the outside face and the inside face, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons why Japanese people can be perceived as being very, very polite. In fact, they are very polite. Um, but after you're there for a while, you kind of realize that also it's very difficult sometimes to see the true face of Japanese people. They don't really show it to each other that much either. It's part of the culture, right? There's this um, ability to kind of, kind of manage your social face in order to get on best, get on really well with everybody around you, you know? Um, so it's good and bad, right? Um, one of the things I realized when I came to Okinawa was that Okinawan people are much more sort of, you know, wear their heart on their sleeve kind of people. Um, it's funny, as you go sort of further down in a southerly direction, down through Japan, people tend to be a bit more expressive and a bit more emotional and a bit more um, direct in how they, they communicate with you. So I noticed a big difference when I went from Hokkaido to Osaka. That was the second place I went to university in Japan. and. Um, in Osaka, Osaka, people in Osaka are renowned for being loud and, um, you know, uh, a little bit rude and, uh, you know, just a lot of fun, right? There are a lot of, a lot of the comedians come from that area, you know, they're, they're, they're over the top, right? So, um, and then you go further south and you end up down in Okinawa and, um, yeah, Okinawans are, they're kind of laid back, you know, because they're an island people and island people tend to be a bit laid back, right? You know? Um, but they're also very open and honest, you know, um, but not so much, it depends on the person, but not so much in a sort of an over, overly aggressive way, but they'll just, they're, they're more open with telling you how they feel. Um, so, and then as I learned the history, I realized that, um, historically, you know, Japan had had these very long periods of time when it was a closed country. And the, the, the term is sakoku in Japanese. So literally the, the country was closed off. You couldn't leave, you couldn't enter, apart from some very, very restricted places. Um, and it's kind of interesting, you know, whether you, <clears throat> it's kind of chicken and egg, right? Did, did that 
historical period shape the Japanese mindset or did the Japanese mindset cause that to happen? But there's no question in my mind that that mindset is still very much a, a um, characteristic of mainland Japanese culture. The idea that they're sort of, they can be closed off from the world. Whereas Okinawa always had a much more open culture, you know, this idea that people were coming and going all the time, were trading, uh, moving about. Um, and the more I learned about the history, particularly of um, Naha and Tomari and this area where, where most of the, where the capital city is and where I live now, it's had this very long kind of very international history. <clears throat> and um, so I think that's really, again, sort of shaped the, psych the psyche. And uh, so Okinawans tend to be, like I say, more open um, and more <clears throat> expressive, I guess. So um, for me, that was that was kind of one of the striking differences. <clears throat> and uh, you mentioned that, um, you yeah, know, my wife is Okinawan. I actually met her at university in Osaka. Uh, we were both students in the same university. And um, she kind of stood out to me because she was a little bit different from the other Japanese students. Like I was like, there's something she's not. Um, she also looked a little bit different, right? Um, ok Okinawans, you know, have a little bit of a different look from mainland Japanese. And I, I thought, you know, is she, is she, she Southeast Asian maybe, or, you know, there was something different Polynesian. about her. Not, Polynesian. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. She had that sort of, that sort of more of that look, you know, and, um, and, uh, and had that sort of little bit of a different attitude. And um, so it, it, it is kind of, you know, notice, noticeably different. Yeah, it, it's um, interesting too, because, you know, I was just reflecting while you were talking about that. You now we both, in a sense, we're both Islanders. Um, I'm, I'm Polynesian, I, I'm down here in the, the other end of the, the southern most tip of, I guess, the Polynesian Triangle. Yeah. Um, you know, the same, we have the same ocean bordering both of, both of our, the countries that we're in. Um, and of course, UK is one one large is, is a very large island with mm. with many with many different people coming and going from from there. So, what was it in your what was it like for you growing up and doing martial arts in the UK? Because for me, I guess I came at a, I came up at a time when Terry O'Neill's Fighting Arts International or the Fighting Arts international magazine was very very huge very hard to get hold of actually um <clears throat> and so got very much influenced by what was happening in the uk scene and my impression was that there was all these really amazing japanese okinawan uh, thai filipino chinese indonesian martial arts happening in that scene um, of course there were people that were a little more famous especially if you were doing karate than others um, I'm thinking of uh, the late Inouye Sensei, the late uh, Kanazawa Sensei, specifically of um, Shotokan, uh, Otsuka Sensei of Wadeuryu, and those people of that kind of ilk. What was it like? I mean, from my perspective on the other side of the world, I sort of it must be like a martial arts kind of wonderland um, training in the UK because there's so many people and there's so many practitioners, which has good, good, good and bad aspects. So, how was it for you training in the UK coming up? Yeah, I um, I actually uh, didn't really get to start training martial arts until I was about 17, 17, 18 years old. Um, I did a lot of sports at school, um, always enjoyed sports. Um, but um, I, I, got, I grew up in a household where martial arts were kind of frowned upon. Um, so I, I you know during my teens, you know, I loved watching martial arts movies. I loved all that stuff. Um, but I kind of had to keep it, you know, under the covers, so to speak, because because uh, uh, my mum and dad didn't approve. Um, so when I got to 17, 18 and I was like, OK, I'm going to start to make my own decisions now. I'd left school, you know, back then you left school at 16, right? Um, and, I, and I, yeah, you're right. In the UK, there are really there are, there are great, great options. There are so many different martial arts represented and um, and uh, there were lots of, of great instructors, particularly in the big cities, right? Particularly in London, um, Liverpool. London and Liverpool were two two places where there particularly were some really a lot of really good instructors, and a lot of instructors from Asia who had come over. Um, I mean, I just started off in my little town, 
hometown down in southwest England. And my first encounter with traditional martial arts was with, with a Wado Ryu Dojo. So Wado Ryu Karate. Um, and um, yeah, but that was, that you know, that that's what got me hooked. Um, I was very fortunate that there was a really great instructor there. He's still there. His name's Arthur Meek Sensei. And um, he introduced me to strong traditional ethos training, which I loved. You know, it's hard physically, but also the discipline was there too. But also he had been to Japan. He trained in Tokyo and his stories inspired me. Um, and I think meeting him was what convinced me that that's, that's what I should do too. I should get to to Japan and study. Um, so, um, yeah, Wadoryu was my starting point. And then I was, and, and basically I just wanted to get to university so I could get to Japan as fast as possible. Um, when I got to university in London, then there were so many more options to train. I jumped into jujitsu training. Um, I was training, honestly, if I, I was training more jujitsu than karate at that point, I was doing both. But jujitsu I loved because it was so hands on. There was so much, you know, it covered everything, right? Striking, grappling, you know, we were learning all kinds of cool stuff, you know, choking techniques, weapons, all kinds of stuff. Loved it. Um, I kept the Wado training going. Um, I also did some Shotokan along the way. But if I put Shotokan and Jiu-Jitsu side by side, um, I like the Jiu-Jitsu a lot more, you know. Um, but along the way, I did other things too. I did some boxing, I did um, some Kung Fu, you know, as you do, right? When there's mm. when it's laid out there, as it usually is at university, then you go, yeah, I'm going to try that, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. But the two mainstays have been Karate and Jiu-Jitsu. So, and then, and then I guess the next big phase was, was when I got to Okinawa and I got the opportunity to actually, you know, learn Okinawan Karate. Mm. Um, and that was, as you would expect, you know, you, you, you put the white belt on and you go in with an open mind um, and, and start learning again. Um, but I have to say that the Karate and the Jiu Jitsu training that I'd done up until that point definitely equipped me to get to grips with Okinawa and Karate um, quicker. Uh, so, um, you know, having that kind of rounded skill set, you know, striking, uh, clinching, grappling, uh, cancer to as a joint locks, all that kind of stuff, and some weapons, some weapon skills as well. So, um, so yeah, it felt very natural then to just bring that skill set and then start to learn Okinawan martial arts. What is it you believed coming to Japan, or indeed Okinawa, um, that you kind of let go after spending some time there? What's a preconception you feel you might have you might have brought that since doing what you're doing, you've kind of sort of let go? Um, yeah, well, I think yeah, in the journey through training in Japan and then training in Okinawa, um, you know, you, all, every instructor is human, right? Every instructor has um, their um, their strengths and has kind of their weaknesses. Everybody has, everybody's human. Everybody has character flaws, right? I guess. When you're a foreigner, prison probably company. Pre prison company, <laughs> exactly. exactly. But when you're heading to Japan and you're heading to Okinawa, often you know you are looking looking up to the instructors who you are looking forward to meeting or or you're hoping to meet um, as being sort of representing the ideal of the martial arts that you want to learn, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's good, right? Because it's 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 massively motivating, you know, and and uh, it gives you role models, etc. And a lot of these teachers are exceptional. That's why they are um, recognized as good teachers, right? But the truth is, is that everybody's human and every instructor has their plus plus points and their minus points. Um, when you, if you're not ready for that and you encounter the minus points, that can, that can make it difficult for you to accept the plus points, right? Um, and there's something you can take from every instructor 
uh, some more, some less. But if you, I think you've got to be ready for all of them to be uh, imperfect and human in order for you to be able to accept those things that they can teach you alongside with recognizing that there are limitations in what they're going to teach you. Um, so, so if you're okay with the limitations, then you're going to be, it's going to be easier for you to learn the things from them that, that you can. If you, I, I think you have to go through the process of being disappointed a couple of times though, before you're kind of okay with that. So, um, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get what, I totally, you know, it's interesting you bring that point up because I think that, I think one of the things that Western media is responsible for is understanding exactly what the role of sensei and, and what a sensei actually is, yeah. as opposed to kind of what it is in the movies or what it is in Karate Kid. I think everyone's looking for a Miyagi or a, a, a you know, or Miyagi AK, yeah. um, the Karate Kid or Yoda or Kwai Chen Kane, you know, they're kind of looking for that wizened Kung Fu master that dispenses, yeah. you know, all sorts of wisdom. and. When you put people on a pedestal, and as you've pointed out, I know that I've done that in my own life and in my own training as well, the fall to humanityhood <laughs> is long and it is painful, and it's more painful for the people that have put other people up on uh, on the pedestal. Um, yeah. So in terms of that, what's the extremes, like you know, in terms of your disappointments, where have has a lot of your disappointments sat in terms of experiencing those sort of things? I mean, I guess, in your formative training in, in Japan and the UK, and even since you've been talking now, obviously I'm not talking about individuals, just I guess gen generally speaking. Well, I mean, the biggest thing is, is you know, when there's obvious hypocrisy. So everybody's trying to be better, right? We're all trying to better ourselves. So everybody is subject to not quite living up to, you know, the ideals that we might espouse, but, but we should all be always trying to recognize when we've fall, fallen short and do it better, right? But sometimes, you know, I guess people through ego or um, maybe just kind of, you know, self-delusion um, fall into the trap of saying, kind of saying the right thing, but doing something completely different. Um, and when you see that, particularly from, from seniors who you know, you kind of you kind of scratch your head and go, why? I mean, they must know better, right? But you know, everybody's human, everybody fails, right? But you know, sometimes you know, particularly when they, you know, that they're espousing that message so strongly. Oh, you know, martial arts is about improving yourself as a as a human being, about looking after people and care, you know, looking after your community, particularly the traditional values, right? Um, but then really not trying very hard to live up to that yeah i find that that's that's difficult right mm. i guess as you as you get older you realize that everybody fails to some extent and so you become more kind of like live and let live okay you know we can still be friends yeah even though you know, everybody makes mistakes you know it doesn't mean that we we we're not going to be friends right but um Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to, to swallow if it's a particularly, you know, kind of, it's almost like a habit of, of saying one thing and doing, you know, really doing the opposite. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I guess that's, that's kind of the harder thing. And, but it's always, it's always a reminder to, for me, that you always need to check yourself because it's, it's so easy to fall into that trap. It must be so easy because you know it happens a lot right so so you always need to sort of check yourself that you're not tending down to doing that the same direction you know well, it's, it's really difficult it's and it's really difficult in martial arts because um you know um obviously the most difficult thing is that we want to be genuine and authentic in the martial arts that we do but very few of us actually get exposed to situations where we really get to check and authenticate what we do, right? I mean, because as we move through life, we engineer our situation so that we avoid conflict and we avoid 
you know, finding ourselves in violent situations again and again and again. There are only a few people, only a few people that do that, right? People that are really on the front line. Um, there's very few, very few roles in society where you really are on the front line dealing with violent confrontation all the time. Um, but um, but nonetheless, there is great value in pursuing the kind of the study of that from a distance anyway, right? But but still, you when you realize that you're all that very often you're pursuing the study from a distance and you and and mostly you will be, then again, that can be uh, that can be something that you need to always be aware of, right? Keep yourself in context, you know, uh, keep yourself kind of grounded, right? Not be too, get too taken away with the, the, uh, how can I say? Grandiose the, um, thinking. <laughs> yeah, grandiose thinking, you know, they're kind of, um, you know, having, having, you know, being an expert in violence when you're not necessarily actually, you know, really dealing with violence all the time.